please. Shirley, thank you for a great talk. Uh, so, you know, since you've touched upon your first thing, that our first state or connection is humanity versus a religion. So we see conventional and traditional teaching of fitra. Mm -hmm. When a child is born, the fitra is to have a faith. Mm -hmm. So is the traditional teaching is the fitra is Muslim faith or mm -hmm. just the faith? Mm -hmm. What's price of one is having traditional faith? Because I really struggle with this, mm -hmm. that if I was born in a Hindu family, mm -hmm. there's no way I was going to be a Muslim, most likely not. Mm -hmm. So you see, uh, one of the important things which the Quran teaches us is that we have to be seekers of the truth. So whether we are born a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu or a Sikh or any denomination, uh, once we enter, uh, I would say, adolescence or mature life, our responsibility is always to seek the truth. And this uh, seek the truth is something which becomes incumbent upon us because of that natural curiosity that all of us have. But the thing is that at times we are not that careful in, in, in finding out the truth. But even before that, as the question you have just put forth is that, what about the fact that what is the state in which we are born with? So the Quran tells us that all of us are born on, on, those na on that natural connection uh, regarding which the Quran has said that we acknowledge the existence of the Creator. We have the Creator, the imprints of a Creator in our own intuition. And the Quran has actually referred to this uh, before creation incident in which all the souls were called together to the presence of God. And he said, that, am I not your Lord? And everyone of said, said, yes. So we cannot recall that incident because it has been erased from our memory. But once we enter this world and we look upon our own selves that we are, we have been created, we look at the world around us, we say that of course it cannot be created by itself. There is someone, someone creating it. If all these things that have been put into it, the discipline that it follows, it all leads us to this conclusion that there is a creator. So as far as our birth is concerned, the Quran tells us that the conception of a God is there in our own, in our own intuition. And then it is up to us whether to continue to acknowledge him or come up with your own, I mean, your own uh, circumstances and your environment, the way it affects you. For example, if you're born in a, in a family which is uh, tuned to idolatry, then again, something, question that should have arisen in your mind that whether this is correct or not. So you see, your, your, inner, your inner self is born in a way that you acknowledge the existence of a creator. But then your environment comes into play as well. And now it is up to you continue with that or to, I mean, in, in that quest for the truth or to end up in some other way. But what I can, what I have understood is that if you have that conception of creator in you and you pursue your life in that way, then if you are sincere in your quest, perhaps it would not matter to God where you end up as long as you are sincere in your quest. But if you were careless, if you didn't give enough time or enough effort, then God will call, call you to account. So to us, it is this, this, this effort that counts. To find the truth wherever it comes. Uh, all humans are equal mm -hmm. and uh, consider them. What about inter religious marriages? So, you see, uh, the Quran tells us that the most important thing regarding marriage, as is the case with many other things, is the concept of monotheism, of, of people who are monotheistic. So as far as monotheism is concerned, all those people who hold monotheism to be an important pillar of their life, uh, they are allowed to marry. And for example, people who might not be monotheistic in the sense that the Quran would require them to be monotheistic. Uh, so if they have the importance of monotheism in their life, they would rather not sacrifice that pillar for anything else. So it gives us this direction that if you have to make a choice of a life partner, always, always think of the fact whether he or she is someone who conforms to this creed of monotheism. Yes. Well, in my experience, I, I've been studying the Quran for over 30 years now, and I've I have had a better part of those translations in front of me for so many years. I can say from my own, from my own personal experience and from the experience of many others of my, my colleagues and even my teachers, that generally all translations are almost 95% similar. So this is like a 5% chunk in which there are certain uh, nuances, I would say, certain specifics, especially dealing to the Sharia part, the law part, in which there have been interpretive differences. And they come out more 
in the tafsir, which is the explanation of the Quran, rather than in the text. So, mostly you will find the translation to be quite close, except as I said, in that top 5%. And uh, for that, that area, what I would or, or I always recommend is that just get, pick up any translation and just read through it. And whenever you have a question, just consult the tafsir, just consult the exegesis. So, what happens generally is that we are made to go through a tafsir as if we are going to read it from one from cover to cover. But to me, tafsir or chronic exegesis is like a like dictionary. You don't read dictionaries, you consult dictionaries whenever you have an issue. So, I would say that just pick up the Quran, read any good translation that you are comfortable with, and whenever you have a question in mind as a result of reading that, that uh, translation, just consult a, a good tafsir that you might trust. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, the first uh, I'm struggling between the fact that they just have to make a concept that somebody born here is born in the world, is born in the So, my, again, this, my understanding is many of them are born in the world. Mm -hmm. So, why do you have to be able to different between them? Right. That, that's the struggle. Okay. okay. So, a couple of points might help uh, us understand this issue. First of all, uh, whoever a person is, regardless of his sexual orientation, uh, I mean, we have to respect him as a creature of God, regardless of his sexual orientation. This is my personal view. I can differ with him, I would not agree with him, but I would not like him to be discriminated with, I would not like him to be looked down upon. And I think uh, what has happened mostly in the Muslim community is, because I can, I can speak for our community, is this intense element of hate that is inculcated in us. It's just like, uh, if I can give this example, the hate between India and Pakistan when they, they play each other in, in cricket. Maybe, or, uh, it's like a tremendous rivalry. So the hate that we have between certain countries is something that has been injected in our, I would say, that in our genes that we have to be uh, very hateful of these things. I think personally, I would disagree with the orientation, and I think I have a right to disagree as other people have a right to disagree with me. I have, have this, uh, I would say, something which God has granted me to, to uh, fix a view or to have a view which might not, others might not agree. But I would not think that as far as hating individuals is concerned, this is the right thing. I think dealing with them affectionately, dealing with them in a very kind manner. Is something which I can actually draw a parallel from the Quran. Let me give you this example from the Quran, and this is a, I think it's a huge example. So the Quran, I mean, you can imagine the amount of hate God has for polytheism. God says He can forgive everything but polytheism. Okay? Uh, polytheism is unforgivable. But it says that if you have parents who are mushrik, who are polytheists, who are polytheists, and remember, polytheism is, is something which God, I mean, abhors. Detests. But he says that if they are they your parents who are polytheists, you just cannot leave them alone. You just cannot say that I am going to go away because you are you're doing something bad. You have to be good to them. Remain with them in this world as affectionate people. So I think LGBTQ or people who have this different orientation are way below people who are polytheists. So if regarding polytheists, God tells us to be affectionate to them, even though he detests polytheism. I think this is an uh, object lesson for all of us that even if there are people who, have, who belong to this community, we might have our differences. In spite of having our differences, respecting them and giving them their rights is, is equally uh, something which we have. And the second part, which I would like, I would also like to stress, is that there are things that we are by birth uh, accustomed to. For example, people could be serial killers, people could be kleptomaniacs, whether they have a compulsion to steal. And so on and so forth. So, having a comp compulsion of something at birth does not give us the license to follow. It. So, I would say that if you have a compulsion for, for that particular orientation, we have to treat it as a test and trial. To God. And you have to curb the tendency. I mean, just as you have to curb the tendency of killing people because you are a compulsive killer, we just cannot allow you to go and kill people. In a similar way, if people, I think, have this tendency, and I don't agree with that tendency, I would tell them that this is like a trial and a test that you should curb. Uh, because this is something 
things. In my opinion is something which is against human nature, which God also does not like. But I would not judge you for this. I would not discriminate you for this. But at the same time, differ with you. So I remember just about two months ago, I was in Canada in Toronto, and there was this pride event taking place in Canada. So uh, you know the pride parade that is, it takes place. So we had a big uh, uh, argument, I would say, or discussion, uh, because we were youngsters that I was dealing with, and we had a, a small uh, discussion. And uh, we continued to talk about this at length, and the and the lesson that we ultimately drew, and the conclusion that we made was that yes, we are uh, we would not we would not agree with their opinion, but we would condone that discriminating against them or treating them as people who are outcasts is something which is pretty much below human dignity. And basically, I can also tell you that this community has existed ever since time immemorial. They have just become prominent in the last 40 or 50 years because of the fact that they have been severely oppressed. I can draw a similar parallel between feminism. So women were severely oppressed for a long time and feminism was the result of this oppression and now it has gone to the other extreme. So in a very similar way, people who, were, who belong to this community, remember, they had to face the death sentence in many countries. So if you declared that you were a gay or a, or a lesbian it's 50 years ago, you would be punished by death. So you see, this punishment or this, the way they were treated or the, the way they were treated as outcasts or people who do not belong to your community, it actually fueled an aggression from them. And they, of course, stood up for their rights. And no better place than a democracy like the United States where you can stand for your rights that they stood up. And UK as well, and they made this point that we are different from you, but we would demand equal respect. So I would say yes, you are different from us. We will give you respect. With all due uh, respect, we would differ also with your orientation. So I think this is how we should go about. And I think, as I said, that the Quran gives us this lesson that hating them, detesting them, or isolating ourselves from them is not only the bad thing; it is something which is not recommended by the Quran. The Quran does not say that you bear with your parents who are Muslim. It says, be good to them. In this world, you have to treat them in a very kind way. That's how I, I, I view this issue. So, yeah. Right. Uh -huh. That is being an example that this is what they deserve. Mm -hmm. And we go ahead and start judging them and giving them that permission. Mm -hmm. We have taken upon us. Right. We need to do the same thing. Absolutely correct. So, this is something for God to do. Yeah. So, God did this. And remember, the punishment that they actually uh, were faced with was not exactly for, for this sodomy, it was more of denying a message of God. So yes, the messenger was warning them that they are doing something bad. It was just like the prophet Shoaib telling his people that you are measuring less or you are not properly giving away your merchandise. And at the same time, because this was one of the prominent misgivings that that nation had. So prophets of God come and when nations deny them, the punishment that they get is because of that denial, not because of the thing that they pointed out. Because as I said, different nations are afflicted with different calamities or different, uh, I would say, uh, malpractices. Yes, those malpractices aggravate the situation, but they are not the cause of the punishment. The real cause, everywhere in the Quran, if you go through these tales of uh, all the previous prophets, is their intentional denial of the prophet of God. Yes, the prophet of God had the part, I mean, part of his message was that you should not indulge in these activities, but primarily the destruction of the population of Lot took place because of the fact that they had denied a message. But this does not mean that what they were doing has been, can be condoned in any way. All that it means is that we don't have any right. For example, the Islamic penal code has not prescribed any punishment, any punishment, I can safely say, either in the Quran or in the Hadith, any way for this, for this. I mean, you can legislate for that, but there is no punishment. For example, it has prescribed a punishment for adultery or fornication. But in spite of the fact that, I mean, this existed in the time of the Quran, even before, but the Almighty never chose to specify a punishment for this. So I think personally that these are matters that have to be dealt with in a, in a personal and a private way in which you are able to exchange uh, the idea, I mean exchange your views and at the same time when I, I talk about uh, uh, in this, this issue, one important thing that also comes up is, the, is, the, is God's idea of a family. So when he created mankind, he did not create two Eves, he did not create two Adams, he created Adam and Eve because you see the 
the next in kin, which is going to be produced, he or she, the child, needs the love of the father and the mother at the same time. And the love of the father and the mother, they are different. I mean, the child itself needs certain things from the father, which it cannot get from the mother, and certain things from the mother, which it cannot get from the father. So, the family which uh, God has created is a family in which opposite genders come together and produce a family. And this is for the benefit of the child itself. So, this is the example that I normally give to young minds, especially when they ask this question, that why do you say that this is something you should not do? So, I think that the best I can make out of it is that the scheme of God is such that he has created not two Adams or not two Eves. He has created one Adam and Eve so that they can further the institution of mankind in this particular way. I think it's of course being respected for sure, yeah. But the, the problem is how far do we get in being respected? So let's just say from a Kasaji and some mm-hmm. organization. Let's say we know someone is openly mm-hmm. gay mm-hmm. and was an imam or mm-hmm. a youth director mm-hmm. or a teacher. Mm-hmm. So what should we expand from a leadership perspective? Uh, let me tell you in Montreal there is a there is a gay mosque. It's called a gay mosque because the people, uh, the imam is gay and uh, generally people of the community, they, they go and pray before it. So it's basically it's the choice of the people there. I mean, it's not just being disorientation. There are a number of other factors, whether he's a person who's truthful, whether he's a person who has good integrity. So you see, these are things that come into play while selecting a person. It could be a qualification or it could be a disqualification. So uh, obviously, if you ask me, I do not, not vote for such a person. But then, as I said, that if this is something which is the prerogative or the choice of people who are there. I mean, I am I'm not in a position to impose my opinion. All that I can do is, is give an opinion as a person, I mean, in, in a personal way. But if there is a community who has chosen a gay imam and they are comfortable with it, I cannot go against it. I will not. But if you give me the choice, I might, I might not choose him. Sir. Probably everywhere else. Uh, so you see people, they come to practice Islam, they do all the things that are, mm-hmm. uh, are uh, Christ, that we have done, that we have done, that we have and all of those things. Mm-hmm. But then their actions, other than that, are, are very cool. Very detestable, yeah. Exactly. And, 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 and you see that, and it's, it's frustrating. And it, 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 you realize that that's not what Islam, the true Islam is. When you see the dealings outside of the mosque, mm-hmm. dealing other than this one, uh, what would you, your advice be on on just really helping, you know, mm-hmm. somehow uh, really uh, bringing that topic to light and focusing, you know, so that we focus on those things and helping mm-hmm. all of us improve that side of ourselves, right. not just the, mm-hmm. the things that the ritual side, sure not, right? You know, the, the, the us the right. So I think this uh, this is a very uh, important area which you have referred to, and I think it has arisen because of what I call the ritual centric approach. So you see, uh, as Muslims, we are more prone to rit- religious rituals like offering the Hajj or maybe offering the prayer in a very uh, vigilant way and the rest of the worship rituals without realizing that this is just one part of, our, of, of, of Islam. And if you study the Quran, you find out that even these worship rituals, they are not an end in, I mean, they are not an end in themselves, they are a means to an end. And the, the end itself is to become a better person. So if your worship rituals are not making you a better person, then there is something wrong there. So I think we, what we need to understand is that uh, what we have ended up doing is we think that they are an end in themselves. Worship rituals are an end in themselves. They are, whereas they are a means to that end. The end is to become a better person. And I think this is, this is a radical change that we must bring about when we teach our younger generations how to pray, how to fast, how to do other things. By telling them the wisdom behind uh, these worship rituals. So you see, I have seen parents scolding children for not praying. I have seen, seen prayer leaders scolding children from, from by, uh, in coming to the mosque because they make a lot of noises. And the next thing that happens is that the child starts to hate coming uh, going to the mosque because of that bad attitude. So you see, what happens is that unless you make your child or your you know, people of your, our community understand 
that there is a wisdom, there is a certain expediency behind every act of God, especially uh, the topmost thing which the Almighty wants us is to become purified individuals. So that is what is called tasya, is purification. So purification cannot be achieved unless we have a soft voice, unless we are amicable to other people, unless we are friendly to other people. And unfortunately, what has, has been, uh, I mean, what we have ended up doing is that we have all uh, the regard for God that we might have, but we have all the disrespect that we might have for his creatures. So I think that every person has two relationships. One is the vertical relationship and one is the horizontal. So the vertical relationship is with your, with your God and your horizontal relationship is, is his brethren. This is much like in the family. In the family, your vertical relationship is with your parents and the horizontal one is with your siblings. So a person who is to be a good person must be good in both these directions. What happens is that either we are very good towards God and lacking in our, in our uh, relationship with our brethren or we are very good with our brethren and we lack in that relationship with God. So both these things are needed at the same time. And perhaps as I said, uh, this is something that we need to do when we teach ourselves, our children, uh, that this ritual-centric approach is something which has really killed us. They see the Islam in the Quran. They see the respect from American right. uh -huh. They see the, the honesty. They see the soft way of teaching the teacher. They see all of those things. Mm -hmm. And they feel like, I'm a good person. Or, mm -hmm. you know, right. we're, we're, that's what is the result of the Quran. So then they think in their mind, mm -hmm. I don't need that. Right. Actually, I don't right. Know, I'm, I'm not being nice, good person. Right. So, so you see, they don't realize that people living in the United States they, they follow Jesus, and Jesus was a mighty prophet of God. So I see many Muslims talking about the fact that look at these people; they have taken one part of our religion, and that is they are very good. They are they are better Muslims than they are, they are Christians, without realizing that if they are Christians, so they are also the followers of a very mighty prophet, which the Quran praises. And the Quran has special words for Jesus and followers of Jesus, and so indeed it says. Which means that the followers of Jesus, uh, the Almighty says, we have placed in the hearts of the followers of Jesus mercy and compassion to, a, to an ultimate extent. And I think that I can see that mercy and compassion in our Christian missionaries in so many relief works which, are, which Christians do, and they become an example in that. And we neglect this, this particular verse that actually praises Christians for their compassion, for their mercy, for their human humanity, uh, which the Quran itself has said. So I think that one thing that we need to understand is that uh, we must create this balance in our, in our younger generation that all prophets of God are our prophets, all books of God are our books. And if we start discriminating between them, then this is where we will end up. Look what the Quran says. It says, that we will not differentiate between these prophets. And it says that you have to believe in all books of God. And when it says uh, we have to believe in all books of God, what if we believe in a book of God uh, without reading it? I mean, it could be absurd. So how could you read? I mean, you, you believe in the in the Torah or in the Injil, and at the same time, you don't even know what is written in the Torah. And Injil. So it is here that I respectfully uh, instruct my students as well, and all whom I can reach, reach out to that believing in the past books, believing in the previous scriptures, is it actually means that you have to read them as well, because otherwise. It would be blind, blind following. I mean, it would be like a blind belief. It would be like reading the Quran in Arabic and not understanding it. So, re reading all these previous scriptures and giving due regard to all previous prophets of God. Until we have this, this uh, I would say, uh, approach, uh, it's going to lead us to where it has led us today. This is Surah Hadith, the 57th Surah, and this occurs near the end of that Surah. The 57 I mean, we have to be both. Right. Mm -hmm. That you know mm -hmm. you don't need to mm -hmm. say anything. Of course, we have to 
So I just give that example in our personal life. What if we are very good brothers and sisters, but we are very bad to our parents? So you see, if a person is good to his fraternity and does not have a strong God connection, he can be compared to a person who lives in the family, who is very good to his siblings, his brothers and sisters, but he is not good to his parents. So it's like a vertical and horizontal relationship that we have in our family that is replicated on a larger level with God and his fraternity. So doing one thing and neglecting the other will always make us an imbalanced person. So we have to be good, I mean good towards our parents and good towards our siblings. Therefore, good towards God and good towards our brethren it is something very analogous. Right. So you see, this is a misconception. I mean, this is something which has plagued us. And perhaps the reason for that is that we think that because God is merciful and if we ask for his mercy, he might forgive us. And yes, he might forgive us. But that does not give us the license that we should be slack in that. Yes, God's mercy is infinite. Yes, he could forgive you. But then there's no guarantee. So you see, this is a cliche, I would say, something of a common misunderstanding that yes, we should be good to people. But as far as God is concerned, well, he's very forgiving. So we never know when God could be unforgiving as well. But remember, God has also said that he's, he's very just. He's going to punish you for your evil things. Yes, he could forgive you. But there are certain things that he would be, I mean, he would be called an unjust God if he does not do certain things. So I think we have to believe in the concept of justice of God as well. And his own justice is something which will never, ever uh, desert him. What's more about the so, so you see, if you, uh, as I said, my experience, that is something that you can do if you read the Quran, I mean, if you are well versed in the Quran, and then you pick up the Bible, for example, or the Old Testament, you yourself will be in a best, in a better position to say that how close they are, because it's like a reality check. It's like a reality check. Yes, there are uh, a certain amount of them. For example, let me tell you. One major uh, difference or uh, I would say interpolation that has occurred in the, in the previous scriptures is regarding the prophecies of the last prophet. So these prophecies exist in the Old Testament, they, they exist in the New Testament and the Quran actually lays this claim that uh, Prophet Muhammad was mentioned by name in both these scriptures, by name. And the last prophet just before Prophet Muhammad was Prophet Jesus and the Quran at one instance says that he was sent uh, that these bad tidings that there is going to be a prophet after me whose name would be Ahmad. And in Surah Araf, it is said that his name was written in these places. So, one area in which uh, there has been some interpolation in the Bible is this area in which the prophecies of the last prophet have been tempered with. Similarly, another area is the area in which the son who was supposed to be sacrificed by Abraham, so the Torah tells us it was Isaac. And of course, the Quran tells us it was Ishmael. So this is another area in which a major interpolation has taken place. But as far as articles of faith are concerned, like for example, belief in God and the hereafter, and etc., and all those things, you will find that the, the Injil and the Torah they are ex they are so close to the Quran. Yes, you can ask that where has the belief of Trinity come from, or the uh, or the belief of the Son of God has come from in, the, in terms of Christianity. In my own humble uh, study, I can tell you that they are exterior to the Bible. I mean, they have found outside the Bible uh, through some other doctrines that, are, that, that were available, just as they are amongst Muslims. There are a lot of concepts amongst Muslims which are extended to the Quran, and we think that they are, they are, they are, they are in the Quran. So, uh, I'm uh, barring these concepts which we think are concepts of Christianity, I can tell you that as far as morality is concerned, as far as faith articles are concerned, and as far as certain uh, aspects of Sharia are also concerned, I have studied that. I find, find the three Abrahamic religions to be very close to one another. And as far as the aspect in which they differ when, when others are concerned, as I said, the prophecy aspect and the sacrificing aspect is there. But then this is something uh, which, which the Quran tells us that this is where God is going to correct them or God is going to, I mean, decide their matter once you come to them. So I think that uh, if you have the light of the Quran and 
as I said, as a reality check, you also read the other scripts as it will become apparent to any person who does. So, uh, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. And for you, do charity should be those actions private. Mm -hmm. That's honoring to God. How do you balance that wisdom with also wanting to live out your faith and healthy faith mm -hmm. and showing well, I choose right. to participate in this charity or mm -hmm. choose to give right. to the poor uh -huh. because of God? So you see, uh, it's all a question of intention. If the intention is to show off and the intention is to educate, they are two different things. See, at times, in order to educate our young ones, our children, we do spend in front of them so that they can learn this channel. So they are, so they can, are inspired. Similarly, in case of this public calamities like these disasters, like for example, earthquakes and floods, at times we do participate publicly in them so that other people are also inspired. So I think there is a, there is a, there is this, uh, uh, reconciliation between those things, these things that if your purpose is not to show off, uh, then at times when you do spend publicly, it has to be with the intention of encouraging other people, motivating them for the same cause. But if there is some other intention, then that should be avoided. And if this is something that can be avoided, then the best thing would be that you do so between yourself and God. But as I said, to teach your young ones, to inspire other people, at times you have to come out in public. But then it should be strictly because of this motivation factor, not because of any other factor. So we can wrap up the session. Okay, thank you very much for being here and uh, hope to remain in touch and uh, let's uh, make this vow before we leave this place that we will try our best to become better human beings. Thank you very much.